Airing on Asheville FM in Asheville, this is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, you'll hear an interview with Jeremy White, filmmaker, activist, and street medic who's facing prison time in what has been dubbed the San Diego Antifa case. You'll hear Jeremy talk about what happened on January 9th, 2021 at the Stop the Steal rally, how the police interacted with members of American Guard and Proud Boys as they assaulted passersby, the conspiracy theory-driven DA Summers Stefan, and where the case is now. This interview was recorded in mid-March of 2024, before the case had resumed. You can find show notes with links to fundraisers for some of the defendants, as well as the transcript of this interview at our website. My name is Jeremy. I uh, go by he or they pronouns, and uh, I'm an activist and organizer based out of Los Angeles. Jeremy, could you give a brief overview of uh, of what happened on January 9th, 2021 at Pacific Beach in San Diego? And kind of like when you showed up there, what what you and other folks were expecting? I know this was just three days after the right wing demonstrations took place across the USA, including in D.C., you know, with the attempted coup. So if you could kind of just talk about what what the air was like and sort of what the call was for this demonstration and what you were expecting. Yeah, so on January 9th, 2021, there was a protest by some San Diego Trump supporters, right wingers that was planned. It was a stop the steal rally uh, like they were having all over the country. The thing about this one protest, it, it wasn't just politically charged Trump supporters. It was members of the Proud Boys and American Guard that had also vocalized that they were going to be there. Um, as we know now, you know, watching all everything that happened with uh, with the D.C. hearings, the, the Proud Boys have been proven to be a, a violent gang. So, uh, and then the American Guard is a well-known white supremacist group that's always getting wrapped up in violence. Uh, I don't think it started in San Diego. I think it started on the East Coast, but it's it's definitely got a stronghold here. They decided to to have this rally, and local anti-fascists from San Diego put together a counter protest. People were invited from neighboring cities to come support if they could. And I was invited to come take part as a street medic, which is something I've been doing for years now. We got down there. It was kind of like any other action with, with these right wingers, you know, like standard procedure, the cops securely have their backs to them facing us with their weapons and their batons. These guys were violent from the moment we hit the ground on the boardwalk. We were shot at with a BB gun by the kid of one of the American guard members. Um, people brought knives and smoke grenades and different kinds of weapons, vests, things like that. And, uh, we just went through like a counter protest throughout the day. It was certainly no different than most other actions I've been to. I, I was there de-escalating, treating people. We go home after the police call a dispersal order. I don't even think there were arrests made that day. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think there was any arrests made that day. So we all go home and um, 11 months later at 4.30 in the morning, 12 uh, activists from San Diego up to Los Angeles had their homes raided at, at the same time. And uh, I've been dealing with this court case since in and out of court for more than two years. Um, would, just to, <clears throat> since you were there, like, and you could see where the, the crowd of stop the steal folks were like putting their energy, like is, why did they go to Pacific beach? It sounds, I mean, it sounds like a, a pier area near the ocean. I don't know if it's some sort of, is it like near the administrative center of, of San Diego? Is it, um, is there a federal building there? Uh, or were they just like waiting for a counter demonstration or just kind of getting angry at passersby? What was, what was that like? Uh, I think they just wanted publicity and, and visibility in their, in their, choice of a location. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not from San Diego, so I'm not super familiar with the, with the lay of the land there. Um, but it is, like you said, it's like a pier. It's like uh, going to Santa Monica to, to have a big uh, protest. 
And I will say with, with our experience with, with the Trump supporters, they love going to places like that. Like they would constantly gather in Beverly Hills and Santa Monica, Hollywood to, to have their little hate rallies. So um, I think that was just the case. They were just looking for a, a very visibly public place to throw up their Zeke Heil salutes and whatever that else they were doing that day. So would you talk a little bit about the sort of the politics of San Diego? Uh, you've mentioned that groups like the Proud Boys or uh, American American Guard, you said, yeah. Um, and other like, the, I mean, these are these are like fighting clubs. This is one thing that they focus on is brawling with people in public places, like Western chauvinist organizations. Um, and yeah, so it kind of makes sense that they're like, they're looking for fights because this is what they do. And this is the aesthetic that they pull together. Can you can you give like an overview? I know you said you're not from San Diego, but you're close enough to the region. If you could talk about sort of the politics of of the town, I know it's a big military town. Like there's a lot of naval installations. Um, it's right near the border with Mexico, so I'm sure it's like there's a lot of angry white people that are politicized around that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's you hit the nail on the head, and it's it's oddly like I've been going to San Diego um, most of my life. I grew up in in Los Angeles, so it's uh economically is it just seems like a nice little beach town but then when you get into politically uh it's a lot more right-wing ideology out there like you said about the border you know i don't i don't know the stats on this but i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of border patrol agents live down there because it's so close um and definitely a strong showing of of right-wing political support that, that we could see san diego up into orange county uh was was very pro trump as well that definitely tracks. So, eleven. You said eleven months later, four yeah. a.m., four thirty a.m. Uh, knock on the door. Can you talk about what the arrest was like? It was brutal. Um, I, I had just been kind of getting to know the next door neighbors. We I just moved into the place I'm at, and we were up late, probably two thirty by the time I went to bed, and. I go to sleep and it, it felt like 15 minutes later, there's pounding on my door and a megaphone. And I was so disoriented. I, I threw on a bathrobe and started rushing down the stairs, slipped on the stairs, got to the door, you know, still tying my bathrobe shut when I opened the door and there's an AR 15 and like 15 cops with a megaphone and a strobe light pointing at my face. Uh, it was pretty horrifying. Um, they didn't announce who they were there for. They never at any point said names of anybody. They just said occupants of the address. I was the first one out. They made me, you know, without even having my robe tied, made me walk towards them and then turn around and, and get down and all that. So it was early December. It was very cold. Um, myself and my roommates were brought outside and just held outside for about an hour on the concrete with no shoes on. And then finally they brought me in and said, we have a warrant, a uh, search warrant for basically everything you own, every, every electronic, um, any, any bit of gear, any black clothing, even like they took stuff that had nothing to do with protests. Um, they took art off my wall. That was like personal art that they said was Antifa art, which is really funny. I, I hope to see that in court. Uh, like as evidence, like they took my squid game masks that I made for cosplay for Halloween the year before and, and filed it as evidence. Um, but yeah, we, we got through um, a few hours of them searching and then they hauled me off to San Diego with, uh, I mean, not with, I wasn't in the car with anyone else. We were all brought separately, but then I started to see people file into this holding room and it was apparent that this was a, a mass operation. Like they, they hit 12 people at the same time uh, so early in the morning that nobody could, you know, call each other or mount a response or warning or anything as, as they do. And um, yeah, we just started slowly finding out about it while in jail, trying to get calls out to figure out what was going on. It was very scary. Yeah. It, it, that sounds really really frightening especially if you're not being told what what the hell's going on antifa art huh apparently <laughs> and what's funny is i have a, a ton of anti-fascist art in my house i make and like support local artists who are leftists so i have a lot of great art leftist art 
this was not that it's my film design logo that i made for myself and i, I made a little tiny painting of it and they said that this is some kind of antifa related artwork so that was really funny yeah well apparently they're art critics yeah. <laughs> that's great <laughs> um, yeah would you i guess would you talk a bit about the and this, this was multiple agencies i mean it was out of the jurisdiction so oh, yeah anyway but you were talking like in another interview you've mentioned well could you could you go rattle off some of the names of agencies that were involved in this yeah it was a multi-jurisdictional multi-agency task force between san diego pd uh, lapd and la sheriffs so i had representatives from all those fine organizations inside of my living room you know threatening and bullying and it's like it's crazy i still walk through there sometimes and can feel the energy you know yeah. um i remember the the thing that i said to them as they were as they finally like like took me off they let me get dressed in front of like 10 cops inside my living room stripped me down naked and made me get dressed so i can go to jail and then they were taking me out to the car and i saw i mean the entire block is cop cars 30 cop cars from end to end and that was just for me and I didn't even know at this point that there were 11 other people. And I told him right before he put me in the car, you know, we could have health care, but we have this instead. And I didn't it, at that point, I didn't even know the scope of it. Um, once we got locked up, I started hearing the cops from San Diego talk about all the overtime they're racking up and, and you know, chuckling with each other about how they're, they're making money. It's just surreal, you know. Yeah, it's a good thing. They're union jobs. Um, yeah. God, that sucks. So I guess would you yeah would you talk a bit about the so-called San Diego Antifa case, uh, what's alleged um, and who stands accused, and then I'd like after that to get into particular charges that you that you were facing initially. Yeah. So the San Diego Antifa case has been brought forward by the DA of San Diego, Summer Stefan, who i didn't know anything about her never heard her name until this this case and you start looking into it and she's got alarming ties to local groups like the american guard um, right-wing hard-right political donors down in san diego like there's her biggest donor is the father of that kid who just got indicted on the january 6th riots um a well-known internet influencer that started stirring the pot for january 6th and uh, he's been wrapped up in the in the lawsuit now so she's got close ties uh, there's been some like quid pro quo stuff where a member of the american guard got arrested the sheriffs in san diego themselves uh, recommended prosecution and she declined and then there's a campaign contribution from from the guy in question so there's stuff like that that we're definitely going to bring up at trial and show the jury you know 12 antifa they're anti-fascist activists. Like, there's not even, there's no org. There's no, like, I don't, I never once paid dues or was on an email chain or anything like that. It's not an organization. It's just, a, it's an ideology, um, as, as we know. But uh, 12 of us were arrested as if we were some organized criminal gang. And the actual organized criminal gang of the American Guard was, like, completely off the hook. And the stuff they were doing that day was crazy to think about like at the end of the action after they after the police issued the dispersal and all the leftists went home and started essentially avoiding uh being hunted by the police as we did exactly as they asked and went back to our cars you know we, we've all seen that um the american guard was free to do what they intended to that day which is initiate violence unchecked on the community and they did just that there was there was uh two people walking down an alley the man had a shirt on i don't know what the shirt said it was something about george floyd or black lives matter i don't even think he was at the protest if he was he was just a local that was interested so he's walking away and this group attacks him jumps him and the the female companion he had with him jumped them and beat them up so bad that the woman pissed herself and then they bragged about that on the video afterwards and this was all this is all hit the desk of the da uh she's seen it all and she has refused to prosecute any violence that the right instituted so it just becomes a clear case of selective prosecution and it's incredibly politically motivated uh when she was first the one of the, one of the other defendants that's still going to trial with me was the first to get arrested like he 
I think a few months before all this happened, he was arrested. I could be wrong on the exact details, but he had a court case before we ever got to court. And I guess Summer Stephen or her, her, uh, I, ADA. Say minion. I was going to say minion. <laughs> yes. ADA. Um, were straight up just quoting Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram in court to the judge to try to make their case. And that's, unhinged in regards to like Antifa being this gang. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Welcome to Molotov Now, a podcast about taking action. In Molotov Now, we analyze and discuss news articles and stories of resistance from around the globe and connect them to our struggles here at home in Aberdeen, Washington. In the spirit of building solidarity between the rural and the urban, we hope to inspire direct action in the face of oppression and to light a fire to find each other in the darkness. This is the Final Straw Radio on the Pacifica Network, and you're hearing our interview with Jeremy White, a defendant in the so-called San Diego Antifa case stemming from a counter-demonstration to a Stop the Steel rally in San Diego, California, on January 9th, 2021, at which Jeremy showed up as a street medic. This interview was recorded in mid-March of 2024. Yeah, so you were just talking about like the violence that was conducted by by the participants and, and some of the participants of the Stop the Steal rally that yeah. was there. Um, and uh, as I understand, too, they, you know, members of that crowd were throwing smoke bombs at people and were shooting with, like, BB guns and, and such. Is that yeah. right? There was a, a kid who came to the event. It was pretty early on, if, if memory recalls, before, before the big head-to-head clash between the two sides. They were just stalking us on the boardwalk. They'd send a couple people in to harass uh, one of them was a, a minor. He was like 17 ish. Um, came in with a group of his friends coming in saying Antifa and he pulled out a BB pistol and fired it. And he actually got detained and let go and no charges were filed for him bringing a weapon to a protest. So it's, um, it's, it's clearly a one-sided thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I mean, considering the kind of damage that even like, I mean, not to not not to make light of it, but you can shoot your eye out with one of those and like directing that towards people with political motivation is I mean, in North Carolina, if it was a leftist, they would call that coming armed to the terror of the people, you know, a misappropriation of a of an anti clan law that's on the, you know, on the books. Yeah. Well, actually. Uh, you were talking about conspiracy theories and the prosecutor, but as I understand, you also heard some of the, like similar conspiracy theories touted among some of the arresting officers, right? Or at least the officers on duty at the day of, I'm not sure which, concerning George Soros. Yeah, I was I was asked if I got money or how much money I got from George Soros for protesting as were some of the other defendants when we first got pulled into interrogation. And I just laughed and told them, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I want a lawyer. And it was very odd to hear it in person from an authority figure like that. Like I've, I've had that levied against me for years now on online and even in person at protests from some, some of these right wingers, but to have a, a detective, Two detectives asking me that officially on a, on a recorded thing was mind blowing. Very surreal. Um, I've never been paid. Like I've all of my whole history of activism has been grassroots. I've never joined any NGO or anything because I just it feels inherently flawed. So I've never gotten a dime for for doing activism or organizing unless I was broke and needed support and put out a request for funds for something and people would help. But yeah, it's, it's, it's insane to me that, that uh, they really do believe that we're this shady funded thing that, that BLM was the same thing. Um, it's, it's wild to me that they just can't understand. I think that's the crux of it. Um, that's kind of what I experienced with the gamut of, of political organizing from, from like marching for Bernie back in the day to, to marching against fascists. Um, they just don't understand the passion 
and and how we feel the need to to be out there and and stand up for what we believe in so we have to be paid we must be paid right i think that's the the attitude i've gotten across the board yeah yeah and and not only not only do we have to be paid but that we need to have someone giving us orders yeah you know and and it it falls in like when you're pointing to this like yes influential survivor of the holocaust from hungary who does run like liberal think tanks and is a billionaire. Like he does, he does fund politicians. He does fund um, organizations. But again, as you said, mm-hmm. like being an anti-fascist does not mean you're involved in an organization. And, and it's a pretty old trope that was like, this was a, a Nazi and clan thing back in the 1930s was the idea that black folks couldn't be organizing themselves dumb workers couldn't be organized themselves into unions without somebody trying to motivate them through pay um, because they have some nefarious plan of breaking down the the righteous social order of the United States or challenging like natural racial separation or whatever sort of whatever sort of story people are telling themselves who who believe in these like anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. It tends to be Jewish yeah. string pullers. It you know definitely goes back to Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion stuff, um, and that's that's a thing that's been repeated by by Summer Stefan, uh, as I understand. It was on like a website. I think your lawyer maybe back in November. Oh yeah, brought a challenge in the court. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, he he filed a motion for dismissal based on selective persecution and really shined a light on her hard right ideologies. Um, that was part of it. She she had reposted and shared some really questionable stuff. Just her associations are, are super sketch when you think about like the the people that she's getting money from and and how that manifested into this court case. You know, to trying to set a national precedent for going after anti fascist protesters as if they're a gang. But the the motion didn't pass. Uh, it is. It, hopefully, I, I believe, and my lawyer believes, will we'll make an impact. Um, because the judge has seen it and we can we can talk about these things in, in trial and talk to the jury about it. But it's um, for, for me, it just seems very obvious that there's a, there's a quid pro quo. Um, you know, none of these guys, there, there's, there's another thing that happened while we were on the ground. Um, we didn't find out about it until way later, but the police were on their radio to each other from the helicopter down on the ground. They were talking back and forth, very clearly understanding each other, having a full on conversation about the Proud Boys have hijacked this protest. They're not with the program. They're anti-police and we can't control them anymore. And this was after when they gave their first dispersal order, we said, cool, peace. We left. Right. And the Proud Boys and American Guard and other people there just decided to get more violent and unruly as as the day went on. And that's exactly what we knew would happen. So the fact that she hasn't prosecuted any of that really, I think, speaks to who she is as a person and what her political beliefs are and how they're clouding anything, any semblance of justice in this situation. I mean, if I was a cop, too, I'd be pretty pissed off about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thinking these are your guys, thinking they had your back, and then they they give you the middle finger, too. And it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, also just like, yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about the the DA giving you the finger, <laughs> like, okay, yeah. like the counter protesters have left of their own accord once they were asked to. And then you've got these biker looking dudes who are still like trying to make problems and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And perfectly fine, you know, attacking cops, as has been seen in a lot of instances around the country. Absolutely. A few days later. Absolutely. Six. Yeah. Just three days later, yeah, they were they were celebrating it among themselves. Uh, some of the people present on the day in Pacific Beach were at the Capitol too, and some of them that were present were at downtown LA just three days before. They they had their own like J six thing where um, right at City Hall they were they were assaulting and attacking people that walked through. Um, it was really ugly. And the cops were just letting them do it. Not only were they letting them do it, there was a counter protest, a small counter protest of, of leftists across the street. And I watched this, this police captain, Captain Rick Stabile, lead the right wingers into our midst and then leave. And it turned into a big brawl. And he just let it happen. And then when the right wingers got their asses beat, 
um, by the people that were there, you know, he arrested everybody. And you could just see, like, that's not how he thought it was going to go. He thought these guys were going to just demolish all these these soy boy leftists, you know, Antifa kids. But it's it's just crazy to me how that, that always goes down. And the, the cops are I just, I haven't believed in cops for a long, long time. But just the idea that they're there to protect and serve anything but the ruling class and their own personal interests is, is so confused <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah and he even say that that the that that officer like let sat back and let it happen it's it's more like he made it happen <laughs> like, oh made it happen yeah i mean and then we found out the day of that was j6 he's on his phone well well supposedly organizing this police response cheering on the riots that were happening in dc on twitter yeah, and and this is like wild speculation. I mean, just to say, like law enforcement obviously like often has a less than objective viewpoint of how the world operates and and what's going on in the world. And there were a lot of like during the Trump administration, and I'm sure on either side of it, a lot of those. Um, uh, oh, what are they called? <sighs> I'm probably going to cut this, but 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 a bunch of those those information centers that are adjacent to like their mend is being a place for sending around communications between federal law enforcement and local jurisdictions. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, a bunch of them had been found to be purveying a lot of like carrying a bunch of just right wing conspiracy theories that had like a lot of them relating to Antifa, a lot of them relating to international funding for Black Lives Matter so I mean that that you know fusion centers, a bunch of information in fusion like fusion centers because they don't really have that much oversight from the outside carries the sort of far right perspectives that are on the bias path of the cops that are running them in the first place. To get back to like when you so when you got arrested, um and and booked, what were you initially charged with? I don't even remember. It was five felonies. Uh, I think it was multiple assault felonies conspiracy to riot i think there may have been committing a riot as well but i it was a lot it was very overwhelming and i i had this um this uh public defender that hadn't even looked at discovery hadn't filed a single motion had done no work on the case and was trying to get me to plead to to all five felonies and i'm so glad that i didn't i didn't go with that i mean i i never would have I, i'm a fighter i've been doing this a long time but just weeks later a month or two later the grand jury indictment came down and it was dropped to two so luckily nobody took those initial charges because i think they all reduced a bit which as you know like grand jury indictments are the easiest thing to get uh because it's just it's the prosecution with the grand jury and there's there's no oversight really they get to just pitch and plug in their heads whatever concepts and ideas they want and there's no defense there to to argue it and even still the the charges were reduced from five felonies down to two the felonies i'm facing right now are felony assault and felony conspiracy to commit a riot and those charges are completely ludicrous i never touched anyone that day i didn't lay my hands on anyone i didn't i didn't uh institute violence on the guy they're saying i assaulted if you look at the video, which I finally got to do a year and a half into this case, what they're saying is that I pointed at a guy and then he got jumped as if I said, that guy, get him. And then the crowd responded. That's ridiculous for many reasons. First off, I was there as a medic, clearly marked as a medic, and I was from out of town and had no power, control, sway, understanding of the lay of the land or who was here. I was just there to help. So the idea that I would be able to just point and they would do my bidding is ridiculous. Uh, they obviously think that I'm the ringleader of, of Antifa in like either Los Angeles or Southern California or whatever it is that could not be further from the case. I really in, in that space and that like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor summer that we went through, I was super focused on stepping back, not taking the lead on anything as, as, a, as a white guy who was there to support. I'm just there to support. And there was no shots being called by me at any point in time. I was literally just there doing community mutual aid and, and defense um, during all those tumultuous times. So that's that's the 
assault charge. Um, what I was actually doing on the video, which I finally got to see, is I was pointing down an alleyway because one of the American Guard guys had just thrown a smoke grenade over the police line right at us. And the police were getting edgier. They were starting to, and we, we know, like when they see smoke, they start to freak out. They can't see anymore, and it doesn't matter who threw it. Um, so I was pointing down an alley toward an egress point in case people wanted to get out of that that situation. Um, but they're saying I pointed at this guy. The other charge is conspiracy, which, like I said, I, I, I don't even know. I still don't know. It's been two years. I still don't know most of the names of the other defendants. I had no relationship really with any of them, especially people in San Diego. Like it was it was just uh, showing up to a protest thing. So the idea that I conspired to commit a riot, I mean, I didn't conspire and we didn't commit a riot. There wasn't there wasn't a riot because nobody was arrested for rioting. You know, it's uh, just very, very much just grasping at straws to, and, and throwing everything at the wall and seeing will stick with with my case. So we're just we're fighting. We're going to trial this month and um, just going to fight it to the end. You know. There ain't a drone up in the sky that I'm afraid of Not a single pig alive that I would run away from I'm still high for death march Shout out to your pay stub And your supervisor if he's a homie straight up The homie told me he been working round the vets Filipinos that they use made promises to and left Promises that they have broken Now coaxing them with a check And neglected the fact they laid on a compensation bet The comrades get it poppin' though He said with confidence Man, my smoke a half a zip a day Dealing with politics I said I feel you, bro I rolled another and we talked about How we could get it structured by the summer Said I am down a rally I, I will call you family Cause I will take a bullet for my comrade Gladly I am down a rally I, I will call you family cause I will take a bullet for my comrade happily Building with the comrade, sharing with the comrade Diddy vibing volley with the comrade Down a couple drinks with the comrade Criticize the comrade, take the criticism from the comrade And try and get better for my comrade Solid with the comrade, never ever read on any comrade I gotta stay sharp for my comrade Depending on a comrade, take a couple bullets for my comrade there ain't a drone up in the sky that I'm afraid of Not a single pig alive that I would run away from I'm still high for Arab Spring Shout out to your pay stub and f*** your supervisor if he's a Straight up She put her hand out with a standard size flyer Had a baby in her arm Other children right beside her She said she was trying to spread the word To get the message out that if they send her back to Holly School Her kids will be without hands that'll feed a little one Literally sick of them Forcing the family to leave a home so they can profit from Told her I would see her at the meeting after work Walk an extra lap around the block to burn what I can burn And said I am down a rally I, I will call you family Cause I will take a bullet for my comrade Gladly I am down a rally, I, I will call you family Cause I will take a bullet for my comrade Happily building with the comrade Sharing with the comrade Diddy Bob and Molly with the comrade Down a couple drinks with the comrade Criticize the comrade Take the criticism from the comrade And try and get better for my comrade Solid with the comrade Never ever read on any comrade I gotta stay sharp for my comrade Depending on a comrade Take a couple bullets for my comrade The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to the jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcast wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. This is
This is the final straw radio on the Pacifica network, and you're hearing our interview with Jeremy White, a defendant in the so called San Diego Antifa case stemming from a counter demonstration to a Stop the Steal rally in San Diego, California on January 9th, 2021, at which Jeremy showed up as a street medic. This interview was recorded in mid March of 2024. Yeah, and this is like total speculation, but like I wonder if they're operating under like and, and not in good faith, but like operating under the conspiracy theory that was present on Jan sixth in DC that was being propagated that Antifa were the people that were doing the violence and that were doing the riot. I mean, the cops obviously, if there's like a line of cops between two crowds of people and they can see them fighting with each other and they can see the politics and probably know some of the individuals in the crowd that are you know, that are agitating and that are attacking bystanders and stuff, they're going to know that's not true. But yeah. I guess who knows in the wild world of the DA, you know, what 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 she actually believes besides what Summer Stefan has said. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, I have no clue how deep, um, you know, like she probably thinks we're all shape-shifting <laughs> aliens, <laughs> like protesters, I don't know. I have no clue how deep the conspiracy goes. Uh, in the minds of the people that are prosecuting this, but it, it doesn't feel like any semblance of justice. I've, I've heard the judge say in court that this just sounds like a bar fight. Like, why are we doing this? What, what is this about? Like we're, we're coming back for two years, pushing the trial. It, it It's going because they won't drop the charges because they really need this win. And um, I'm just not willing to give it to them and neither are uh, the other defendants that have held on so and, and it's not like the ones that pled out it's it's heartbreaking most of them pled out because they had public defendants that weren't doing anything for them just like just like i did i got lucky i got in contact with an amazing lawyer that has been working this case pro bono for more than a year and i would not be talking to you right now if that wasn't the case um so i really it's it's heartbreaking that these other these other individuals um, were scared and and threatened by the system enough that they took charges that are completely unjust. Yeah, yeah, and one would imagine that if if there was a like a pre existing conspiracy, I know that like the in Georgia with the Stop Cop City, like they're trying to make the argument with their RICO indictments that like that anyone who answers a call to come to a thing therefore must be connected somehow. And at least there is some degree in in the Georgia case, as much as the state is like fighting against it for people to try to get together for collective defense. But that doesn't seem like that's really been able to be pursued in the San Diego case, which kind of just talks about the disunity between the individuals as opposed to like pre-existing strong relationships or a big daddy Soros money coming in. Oh, absolutely. I've been an organizer for a long time and, uh, you know, from everything from political to grassroots, mutual aid, humanitarian work, stuff like that. And this was not organized. There is no organization behind it. It was it was fly by the seat of your pants, you know, just people wanting to go out there and stand up against the the police state, the fascists that were feeling emboldened more and more to come out and enact violence on communities. It, it's just it's crazy to me that um you know, we've we've glorified World War Two and fighting the Nazis. And, you know, we we still do it to this day. I I don't know. I just I figured like anti-fascist, fascist bad. Why wouldn't everyone be anti-fascist? And it's very very telling. Uh, going through the times we are right now, everything going on in the world right now of how fascism takes root, how it can be supported by people you never think it would be supported by. And kind of how easy it is. It's the it's the frog in boiling water, you know, not realizing it's being cooked. Those of us that have been keeping our eyes out, we've seen it. We've we've seen the water boiling. We've been yelling and shouting it for years now. But for for most of the people in this country, I feel like they they don't understand like just how bad. Like New York has National Guard in the subways. Los Angeles, California, they're implementing crazy laws like like the surveillance state that just happened in L.A. with the uh, the. the getting access to 10,000 cameras throughout the city, including personal doorbell cameras and things like that, which is terrifying. So yeah, I, um, fascism's here <laughs> for sure. Yep. It did happen here. Yep. Um, it, did, it did happen here. I love that. So you've talked about like how you, <laughs> you showed up as a medic 
to to help de-escalate and to help people that were injured because you know you everyone knew at this point what groups like um american guard and proud boys what their modus operandi is (sighs) yeah and so but but i mean you're so you're fighting this in part because this is bs and you don't you don't want to catch some felonies for something that you didn't do but i wonder like if you could talk about like your your fears or views on the implications of the conspiracy charges in this case terrifying um there some of the overt charges for conspiracy are you know wearing all black or saying a cab we were in a signal chat together like an organizing chat that i was just added to like i didn't i didn't put it together i i anyone who knows signal you don't even have to accept those if they have your number they can just add you to a chat and make you an admin so i don't even know when this chat was put together I wasn't involved in organizing it. Like I said, I was invited down just to medic and that's, that's what I went there to do. And that's what I did. So it's, it's really scary. It's scary that we're seeing it already. Stop cop city, um, the justice eight here in LA as well. There are these politically motivated cases where they're, they're going after us with conspiracy charges, Rico charges. And, you know, as much as I love seeing the proud boys, get get their their comeuppance after January 6th it was kind of a little scary for me too to watch them uh and not that they aren't a gang you know like you said before they're a fight club you have to you have to go initiate violence on someone to be a part of the proud boys um and that's that's just them who knows for for groups that are avowed white supremacists neo nazis like the american guard and ram um so yeah, the the whole like building of of an argument that there is there is an active conspiracy like like I mean the the Trump administration including their DOJ was was attempting to approach leftist and anti-racist and or or like black liberation or black civil rights even like organizations as terrorist organizations. And it's not just it's not just the Trump administration like the continued oh, no. like the the long the, the if you want to call it deep state or whatever but like the bureaucracy that is still in power that's you know in the fbi still using terms like black identity identity extremists or anti-government extremists for for anti-authoritarian or like anarchists like it's like the state seems to want to create these umbrellas that you're talking about where everyone wears black or everyone says a cab or everyone who does that therefore must have been inducted to some group and can be treated as a class of people and it's 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 scary. It's what they tried to do uh, with J twenty. It's what they're trying to do in Georgia. It's like on yeah. an international scale. It's what um, Germany has been trying to do in the Lena E case. It's what's happening with the Budapest anti fascist like uh, defendants. Is international yeah. governments working with each other and then attempting to charge like organized conspiracies where it doesn't take organized conspiracies it's just people concerned about fascists taking the streets and attacking people yeah yeah that's uh it, it harkens back to germany doing that in the 30s to um socialists and social democrats and leftists those are the first people they went after and um yeah it's not surprising that they're starting to to do those kind of roundups as as it were um and yeah, I remember being called a climate terrorist by Obama. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for being at Standing Rock. You know, it's um, it's crazy to think that there's one party that fascism uh, uh, claims allegiance to because it's they work so well hand in hand with one another. Um, one's just more overt and the other one's a little more gentle. But at the end of the day, it's just that ratchet effect over and over and over yep yeah so i know this is this is like a different jurisdiction from and neither of us are lawyers this is a different jurisdiction from where you're being charged but it is the same it's the same federal district i'm pretty sure uh the like southern california federal district but uh just in the last couple of weeks Robert Rundo, who is one of the founders of the Rise Above movement, um, which is the inspiration for a lot of the active clubs that have been popping up, white supremacist fight clubs and training groups that are this sort of fusion of 
skinhead and um yeah i guess just like an updated like skinhead mu- movement of sorts but uh with maybe more like overtly fascist politics was he was extradited um from romania he was brought to court to face charges um for 2017 violence that he committed as a member of rise above movement in southern california i think in huntington beach and federal district judge cormac j carney uh, decided not to pursue it, saying that there was a bias in federal, at least federal prosecution of anti-fascists, that anti-fascists were not being charged with violence. So these people that are all over film and promote beating the crap out of anyone they don't like in the streets, uh, like Rob Rundo, get away in this case. I, I As I understand, the, the feds have re-detained him near the border with Mexico um, and are going to try to and are appealing. And he's obviously a flight risk. He's anyway, but b- besides Robert yeah. Rondo, um, which, cause he's done it before <laughs> they had to like grab him in Europe where he was quote unquote in hiding. But I, like, I don't know if, if like, if, if there were 11 people in this case and eight people have taken pleas so far and been prosecuted on these bogus charges, again, different jurisdiction, but it's quite clear that the U.S. quote unquote justice system is not like laying low on giving charges to anti-fascists. A few like a, a month and a half ago, I talked to supporters of Alex Stokes in New York who defended himself mm-hmm. and people around him from proud boy and other alt-right violence in the streets on january 6th and 2021 and he yeah. you know is facing more than two decades inside like a comparable charge to to enrique tario um but yeah I, I wonder like is do you think that there might be room for a challenge in this case to to say like look you've they've they've gotten their blood like it's obvious that anti-fascists are not getting you know if if rundo gets away it's clear that there's a bias about far right people that are documented doing violence and, and all the other people that were at this, at this rally that beat up those bystanders aren't getting, cha- aren't getting convicted of anything. I don't yeah. Know. Ooh, who, yeah. Whose faces and identities have all been confirmed. The, the, all that information has been sent to the DA. So, you know, there's, there's nothing, no charges brought for that. Um, we'll have to see if, if the Rundo case has any bearing on this, you know, at the end of the day, it's all up to the judge and how he feels if if he wants to consider it. Uh, but it is a, a weirdly twisted <laughs> inversion of, a, of kind of what we're going on here. I know their argument was that the leftists instituted instituted a bunch of violence in that case, and, and none of them were arrested. That's that's kind of exactly, except for we're we're not this violent group. We're not a fight club. I don't even. It's not even we. It's just the left. It's. Um, I, I didn't know of any groups while I was doing my organizing that were planning to go out and mess up fash and you get your, your stripes or whatever. If you go beat up a proud boy, like that's just not how we operated. It was usually for me, I went out and saw people half my size getting brutalized time and again, uh, by the police, by these right wing protesters, just, just ganging up on them and, and beating the crap out of them. And that was, part of why I was inspired to go out and stand up against them and, and be there and use my size and my experience. Anyway, the, the Rundo case, sorry. Um, so my lawyer and I have discussed the Rundo case. I believe he's filing a motion uh, to dismiss based on that. I just don't know if it's been done yet and what the outcome will be, obviously. But we'll, we'll see. It would um, it'd be very interesting if we were able to use you know, something so, so politically charged towards the right to, uh, to help in this, to help us in this case as well. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I'll say burn it down! From Embers. Anarchist perspectives from the territory currently occupied by the Canadian state. Find us wherever you get your podcasts or on the Channel Zero Network.
This is the final straw radio on the Pacifica Network, and you're hearing our interview with Jeremy White, a defendant in the so called San Diego Antifa case stemming from a counter demonstration to a Stop the Steal rally in San Diego, California on January 9th, 2021, at which Jeremy showed up as a street medic. This interview was recorded in mid March of 2024. And just a heads up that the fundraiser that Jeremy references got shut down. There's now a Give Butter that is linked in our show notes um, that is active for some of the defendants, as well as another fundraiser from the Anarchist Black Cross Federation chapter for Orange County. Yeah. And not to say, again, like a three-way fight over here, not to say that strengthening the court's ability to convict people is is ever going to like work in the way of actual justice or defending people um but yeah. but it's interesting to see um yeah so what are the next steps in your case uh like you've got a, a hearing as i understand on the 18th you've been doing some fundraising events i guess if you wouldn't mind talking about what's what's up next in court and how how people can support your struggle like you're fighting back yeah um we are Set for trial on the 18th. I don't know if that's going to be the actual date or not. I know that there are possibly a couple motions for continuance uh, on the table. It's the weekend, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But assuming those don't get granted, then we'll be in trial on the 18th. The judge has already called 300 jurors forward for jury selection, so it's it's very real right now. This it's it's surreal to me because I've. It's this has been on the horizon for two years and it keeps keeps going, keeps going, keeps pushing, and I just try to live my life. You know, there's some days, some some blessed weeks where I've been able to forget about this whole thing because the next court case was so far down the road and I could just like do my job and live my life. And now it's just it's very, very real. It's it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, so we're I put together uh, a couple of fundraisers. One is uh, tonight at uh, in Boyle Heights at the First Street Billiards. Uh, I know this is probably going to be aired too late, but uh, we're, we've got a really, really awesome show with like burlesque performers and artists and musicians and uh, food vendors. So we're really excited to do some cool community engagement and solidarity work tonight. And then if, you, if anyone out there listening wants to support, I've got a, a GoFundMe up uh, to cover... Uh, court filing costs for my lawyer. He's doing the case pro bono, but everything costs money. San Diego doesn't have e-filing, so he has to print and FedEx everything. He needs to travel and get lodging in San Diego, as do I. So uh, if you're on Instagram, you can go to superpower to the people, all spelled out. And they're they're helping out a lot with um, promoting the fundraiser and information about the trial. So there's a, there's a pin post there, and in the bio, you can find the GoFundMe link. And it it might not happen on the 18th, right? It's just that's that's the next court date. Yes, yeah, that's that's the next. It's it's supposed to be when trial is set for, but there are a couple different continuances that are going to be entered. It sounds like so. My experience with this trial is was uh, to come to bear. It it might it might get pushed again. We'll see. I, that's that's the hardest thing about this is. You know, I, I was asked on a recent interview about court support, about getting people out there. And it, it's so hard. It's San Diego. And, you know, there's been days where I've had people come out and support. But it turned out to just be like 15 minutes in court for them to set the next date because there was a continuance. And people drove down to San Diego and back to, to be in court for 15 minutes. So until I get really solid estimates on, on when it's going to start, I probably won't, won't put out the call for for support and and by support i want to make it clear um peaceful you know like not disrupting uh, it's very important to uh, to not uh shine a bad light on this on this case by doing that as much as i love disruption it's uh it doesn't gain us anything in this sense you know yeah for sure that makes sense is there anything that I didn't ask about that that you wanted to talk about that either you want me to ask about, like make a prompt for, or just things that occur to you that that maybe you want to get out but you haven't been asked? Um, no, this was a this was a great interview. I think just if anything, folks support jail support in your area. You know, 
there's there's a big need for it and it's just going to get worse um i live in los angeles we have we have a lot of wealthy people here some of them well-meaning that that kind of want to contribute to things and even here in la you know it's it's really hard to raise money for for these um uh, activists and protesters who get caught up on on legal charges so if in any way you can support those around there doing the work it's it's always much appreciated i can say that firsthand um you know i've been arrested for using chalk at a protest <laughs> and had to, had to bail out and like yeah. yeah so and just stay safe out there keep your head on a swivel is there um, and it's it's okay if, if not, I can just cut this. But um, is there any of your art out there, any of the films that you've worked on that you want to point people to, like any independent stuff, or do you want to just skip that? Oh, yeah, I would totally plug um, Bitch Ass. <laughs> it's a really fun. It's a 90s uh, period film, uh, black horror comedy, I guess you could call it. Uh, it's not a straight-up comedy. It's a horror film, but there's a lot of fun moments. It's uh, a guy who dons a mask and decides to start killing the, the local gang that beat him up when he was a kid. And he does so by creating kill machines based on board games. Cause he wanted to be a board game designer. So <laughs> there's like a connect four that's seven feet tall with guillotine blades above the holes. So if you, you know, you have to use your arms and hands to score and then it cuts off your head. There's like a Jenga set. That's, that's uh, like hangs you as you're playing. It, it was a really cool movie. A lot of fun. It's like the saw meets what the the correct version of Revenge of the Nerds could have been, or like the people under the stairs. Yeah, no, it's it was uh, it's a, it's a really fun movie. That's I always love plugging that because it was a total indie uh, passion project that we did during COVID, and it actually it won um, best audience award at South by. Well, congrats! That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then if you want to support my art. Um, yeah, just uh, you can hit me up on Instagram um, at JW Film Design. I've been making a lot of art pieces. Uh, I'll start posting more photos of that stuff if anybody wants to, to buy some pieces. It's very high quality leftist artwork that I make in my spare time. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll be sure to, to, to plug that and um, put that in the social posts when this goes out. Uh, Jeremy, thanks for Fair taking enough. the time to chat and um, yeah, and good luck. Thank you. I really appreciate you. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. I've been feeling like Benjamin Netanyahu is gaslighting me. And not just me, but you, everybody, the whole world. I'm getting the impression that Benjamin Netanyahu thinks he's the smartest guy in the room and that will never figure out his flim flam. He's just too cosmic to get caught or something. It's insulting. It's like he thinks we're all as dumb as Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken, but we're not. So first, the civilian death toll. It's something between 30,000 and a gazillion. It's hard to keep track of it because the numbers keep going up. It's like watching the mileage ticker on your speedometer if you were, say, traveling at the speed of light. The numbers are spinning so fast, smoke is coming off of them. And the vast majority of the dead are women and kids. I'm not pointing out the women part of this because I think women are fragile or delicate or something. I'm pointing out the women part because in a highly patriarchal Muslim society, women are not permitted to be combatants. So we know the vast majority of the dead, who are women and children, are not Hamas fighters. They're humans. Humans trying to survive in a space about the size of an industrial feedlot for cattle in the Texas panhandle. Benjamin Netanyahu, known to his friends by his organized crime name, Benny Bull, continues to tell us that Israel is being careful to target only Hamas and to avoid civilian casualties, even as the vast majority of the dead continue to be civilian. How do you accidentally kill more than 30,000 non-combatants? An analogy here. Say you punch me ten times. You tell me you're trying to punch me in the nose, but seven of the ten punches hit me in the groin. I don't think I believe you're targeting my nose. 
I mean... I don't think I believe you're targeting my nose. You can't use my for a speed bag and tell me you're aiming at my nose. It just doesn't work. Most recently, Israel killed seven aid workers who were traveling in three vehicles in a convoy. The vehicles had colorful logos on the roofs. The aid workers were in constant communication with IDF forces giving their locations. The IDF knew what the aid workers were doing before they even set out to do it. The Israelis accidentally killed all seven people by accidentally launching drone strikes that destroyed all three vehicles. I don't know how you accidentally do all that to people you have on the phone. Benny Bull would have us believe this should be chalked up to the fog of war. I think we should agree with him. I think Benny's perfectly right. I think the drones and bombs are completely inaccurate and that the surveillance equipment is all substandard and that there is no way to tell combatants from non-combatants. And therefore, the bombs and technology are totally useless in the situation that confronts Israel. So the U.S. should recall all of that equipment, all those bombs, all those munitions. The U.S. needs to recall them and tweak them, update them, make them idiot-proof, so no one can use them to accidentally kill aid workers. Then Benny Bull won't have this problem. The U.S. needs to take all of Israel's death toys, the planes, the bombs, the helicopters, all of it. That way the U.S. and its taxpayers are not complicit in the murders of aid workers and innocent civilians. Benny Bull makes the perfect argument for such a recall. Thanks, Benny. You're doing a whiz-bang job. The problem is Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken are idiots. Or, more accurately, Doddering Joe and his minions are actually cowards. Political cowards. They don't want to get on the wrong side of pro-Israel lobbyists and the pro-Israel fundamentalist voting bloc. They greatly overestimate the reach and influence of this particular bloc, and they greatly underestimate the sense of bewilderment and indignation felt by even average Americans who are otherwise inclined to vote based upon their interpretation of the book of Revelation. This even leaves a bad taste in the mouths of pro-Zionists when U.S. bombs launched from U.S. drones kill U.S. citizens trying to feed the hungry. Which isn't to say that Doddering Joe's opponent would handle this any better. Trump is the whack job who approved moving the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So, we could expect him to resume his game of naked twister with any bullshit as soon as he gets back into office. The fact of the matter is, U.S. support for Israel, uh, its unconditional support, is the real underlying problem here. It needs to stop. Sure, food is now getting into the moonscape parking lot that used to be the Gaza Strip. And that means all of those Palestinian civilians have a greater chance of getting bombed into oblivion with full stomachs rather than empty stomachs. But this is still a genocide, a systematic liquidation of an entire population, funded and facilitated and tacitly approved by the United States government. There's really an easy solution here. We need to take the president, his cabinet, congressional leadership, the Supreme Court justices, and the Republican presidential nominee, stick them all in clearly marked aid relief trucks, and drive them in a convoy through the Gaza Strip. If past is prologue, we can finally count on Benny Bull to do something that will make the world a better place. Accidentally, of course. This is Anarchist Prisoner, Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're emailing your congressional representatives and urging them to hop into an aid truck, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road 
Youngstown, Ohio, 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816.